Good morning. And um, with your indulgence, if I may, I think at the start it's gratitude latitude. Because this talk would not have been, had it not been for three persons who have helped me enormously. The first one is Mr. Tito Benerji, who wrote um, a booklet some time back uh, and given talks on the um, Jews of Gibraltar under the title The Jewish Community of Gibraltar. I would also like to thank my cousin Joshua Maracha, who is a trove of information on Gibraltar. And Joshua um, kept me on a very, very short leash, sending me emails uh, very late at night with all these nuggets of information that he was finding. So I want to thank him as well. And thirdly, but not last, I wish to thank uh, Mr. A.B. Serverty because he loaned me the book written by his grandfather, The Jews of Gibraltar Under British Rule. So therefore, this talk would not have been had it not been for those three gentlemen, and of course had it not been because I was invited. I am a Jew. My father is a Jew. My mother is a Jewess. My four grandparents, Jews, lie buried in the North Front Hebrew Cemetery. My family has resided in Gibraltar for well over a century, indeed much more. Their arrival on these shores post-1713 mirrored the fortunes of the wandering Jew pre-State of Israel days, fleeing, fatigued, fearful, surrendered to the ferocity of fate, but fervently Jewish. They were not fickle in their faith, but their simple rectitude and faithfulness in the God of Israel sustained them in a sea of inflammatory harassment, sustained menace, and a wilderness of shattered lives. It is said that Jews are short on geography, but by heck, we sure have a lot of history. <laughs> by the time my ancestors landed in Gibraltar, Jews were synonymous with expulsions. Jews had been expelled from Spain, England, France, Portugal, not to mention the land of Israel itself. They couldn't find comfort for the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in the year 70. Jews who were lucky to escape with a life in the throes of new pogroms and assaults did so moving on, hoping for a change of fortune somewhere, someplace else. Jews did what they always did, clung to hope and cemented their faith, always expectant of a less ashen future elsewhere. The story is told of a Frenchman, an Italian and a German Jew. They were captured by terrorists and they were condemned to be executed. But as the custom goes, they were given a choice of a final meal. I want some good French wine, French pastry, French fries and French bread, the Frenchman wailed. His captors gave all this to him and then shot him. Give me a plate of pasta, cried the Italian, like my mama used to make. His captors gave him the pasta and then shot him. And then they turned to the German Jew, and he said, I want a big bowl of fresh strawberries. The executioner turned round and said, Strawberries? Strawberries won't be in season for many, many more months to come. And the Jew said, So? I'll wait. <laughs> and that is a story of the Jew waiting for a better tomorrow, waiting for something to turn up that will really turn the tide of fortune. The book of Jonah speaks of Tarshish, to which Jonah sought to flee from God. Some historians equate Tarshish with Spain. Indeed, Jewish contact with Iberia dates back to the time of King Solomon. The relationship would have been one based on trade. Although the notion of Tarshish as Spain is academically speculative, more substantial evidence of Jews living in Spain comes from the Roman era. 
the destruction by Rome of the Second Temple in Jerusalem under Titus forced emigration from Israel into the greater Roman Mediterranean expanse. The migration of Jews throughout the Roman Empire predates the destruction of Jerusalem and was facilitated by the Roman occupation of Judea. In his work in 59 BCE, Cicero observed how numerous the Jews were in Rome. There, they were given the exceptional status, even observing the Sabbath without hindrance. But the diabolical and sustained warfare against Jews, which came to sprout centuries later in the guise of the Inquisition, emitted tremors in Spain around the year 306. The Council of Elvira was convened in that year. It issued 80 canonic decisions, and many of which were intended to ostracize the Jews. Canon 49, for instance, prohibited Jews from blessing their crops, and Canon 50 refused communion to any cleric or layperson who had eaten with a Jew. In 711, Berber Muslims, Moors, crossed the Straits of Gibraltar, where they, founded, where they founded the city, famously calling it Jebel Tariq, Tariq's mountain, homage to their military leader, Tariq ibn Ziyad. Conditions in Spain improved so much that despite the Jews being granted the derisory status of dhimis by the Muslims, Jews from across Europe went to live in Spain. Jews flourished in business, astronomy, poetry, mathematics, and philosophy. There were anti-Jewish programs such as the 1066 Muslim assault on the royal palace in Granada. The Jewish leader Joseph Ibn Nagrela and most of the Jewish population, some 4,000 Jews, were massacred. Jews were often caught in the vice of religious tensions and after the Christian losses at the Battle of Euclid in 1108, anti-Semitic riots broke out in Toledo. Many Jews were slain and the homes and synagogues ransacked. During the 13th century, Spanish Jews, like the Jews in France, were required to distinguish themselves by wearing a yellow star on their clothing. In 1462, Gibraltar was captured by the Castilians under the Duke of Medina Sidonia. In 1473, with a rapidly advancing tsunami of anti-Jewish sentiments in Spain, which was to turn into the Inquisition and expulsion, the Duke of Medina Sidonia arranged for the sale of Gibraltar to Jewish converts from Cordoba and Seville. In Gibraltar, these converts would find refuge from attacks and persecutions by the church for two years. Gibraltar provided a safe haven for Jews who had converted to Christianity. In 1476, the Duke of Medina Sidonia entered Gibraltar, expelled the converts who were referred throughout Spain as marranos, swines, casting them to their fate and to the inquisitor's wrath. The Spanish Reconquista ranged between Muslims and Christians. In 1492, the Christians took over full control of the peninsula. Under a succession of tolerant Spanish kings, Jews had become so well integrated, excelling in commerce and intellectual pursuits. They were showered by royal benevolence. In 1391, however, a mob broke into the Juderia, the Jewish quarter of Seville, and they massacred 4,000 Jews. Within three months, 50,000 Jews were dead, and many more were baptized. Anti-convert's feelings were feeding in Spain, a new kind of anti-Semitism, which held that Jewish blood was a hereditary taint which could not be eradicated by baptism. The Spanish Inquisition began officially by papal bull issued by Pope Sixtus IV on the 1st of November 1478. Medieval demonology and anti-Semitic obduracy fed the Spanish monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella, whose marriage in 1469 had unified Spain. On the 30th of March, 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella issued the expulsion decree. The order was to take effect four months later. 
The short time span was a great boon to the rest of Spain because Jews were forced to liquidate their homes and businesses at absurdly low prices. Throughout these frantic months, Dominican priests actively encouraged Jews to convert to Christianity and thus gain salvation both in this and the next world. The most fortunate of the expelled Jews managed to reach Turkey. Sultan Bayezid II welcomed the Jews and mocked the Spanish expulsion, saying, They tell me that Ferdinand of Spain is a wise man, but he's a fool, for he has taken his treasures and sent them all to me. The expulsion from Spain in July 1492 fell on Tisha B'Av, on the ninth day of the Hebrew month of Av, spot on the anniversary of the destruction of the first temple by Babylonians in 586 BCE and by the Romans in the year 70. Mourning the destruction of the temples compounded the agonizing convulsion of the expulsion from Spain. In 1497, the Jews were expelled from Portugal. Sephardi Jews escaping from Spain and Portugal carried with themselves much of their culture, linguistically and otherwise. They also became rapidly integrated in their new surroundings. Sephardi comes from the Hebrew word Sepharad, which means Spain. Broadly speaking, Sephardi Jews are those Jews whose ancestors lived in the Iberian Peninsula. The Jews' expulsion had been the pet project of the Spanish inquisitor Tomás de Torquemada, who believed that as long as Jews remained in Spain, these could influence the tens of thousands of recent converts to and, uh, and to convince them to continue practicing Judaism. In 1704, a force of Anglo-Dutch fleet attacked and occupied Gibraltar. The capture of Gibraltar was made in the name of the Archduke Charles of Austria, the pretender to the Spanish throne. In, 19, in, sorry, in 1707, Queen Anne appointed Colonel Elliot as governor of Gibraltar, and then Gibraltar was declared a free port. And although provisions could be sailed down from England, the garrison sought to replenish from surrounding areas. The nearby ports of northern Morocco provided a godsend. Much of the commerce in Tetuan was handled by Jews. Many were Spanish speakers whose ancestors had settled in Tetuan <coughs> and northern Morocco after the expulsion from Spain. Trade with Gibraltar became lucrative in conjunction with the spasmodic settlements of Jews from Morocco in Gibraltar, some conversos from Portugal and Jewish merchants from London made commercial visits to the rock. The Treaty of Utrecht had not yet been signed and Gibraltar was still de jure part of Spain until 1713. Any Jew found on Spanish soil was exposing himself to the, continue, the continuing tidal wave of the Inquisition. By 1705, Moses Benatar, the Moroccan emperor's treasurer, was conducting part of his mercantile operations with Europe via Gibraltar. Benatar's agent, Samuel Halavi Ben Sefat, resided in Gibraltar for some years. Within a number of years from 1704, Jews became indispensable to the British garrison. Indeed, soon, Jews numbered some 300 souls. Governor Elliot, influenced by commercial greed, posted notices on church doors with the names of some of the Jewish traders, ordering them to leave Gibraltar, failing which they were to pay a hefty fine. Benatar, using his influences, retaliated by imposing a partial blockade on Gibraltar until matters were regularized, following a visit to the garrison by the garrison's chief military engineer to Tetuan. Our Jewish ancestors who came to Gibraltar after its capture in 1704 met for prayers in a warehouse in Bomhouse Lane, the road that leads to the Plaza of Juan Serrano, the square of Juan Serrano. A number of Jews decided to build a synagogue in the street which had been the site of the first synagogue of the Iberian Peninsula. In July 1713, the Treaty of Utrecht was signed and Britain secured the cession by Spain of Gibraltar and Minorca. Article 10 of Utrecht, which relates, as we know, 
to Gibraltar imposed the condition that Britain was not to allow Jews or Moors to reside or to have their dwellings in the said town of Gibraltar. Henceforth, my reference to Utrecht will be solely to the provisions of Article 10. On the 28th November 1713, Lord Lexington, the British ambassador to Madrid, wrote to Colonel Congreve, the Lieutenant General, Governor of Gibraltar, asking him to evict all Jews from Gibraltar. In 1717, Colonel Stanton Hope Cotton, who had relieved Congreve as Governor of Gibraltar, took steps to improve relations with Spain. A Spanish consul was appointed, and with the presence of Jewish merchants in Gibraltar, he complained when their presence was noted and the fact that they had a synagogue in Gibraltar. The governor said that this was a private building and was not a public affair. In February 1718, the Jews were finally expelled from Gibraltar and Morocco retaliated by imposing a ban on all trade with England and Gibraltar. Following the Battle of Cape Passaro in July 1718, when the Spanish fleet was captured and destroyed by a fleet led by Britain's Admiral Bing, Spain closed the frontier with Gibraltar and supplies to the rock were cut off. Jewish merchants who had been expelled from Gibraltar five months earlier took advantage of the situation and returned to Gibraltar as suppliers of the garrison. The British soon learned that reliance on the supply of provisions through the frontier was temperamental and whimsical, and don't we know it? <laughs> In January 1721, a treaty was signed by Captain Charles Stuart on behalf of the King of England and Moses Benatar on behalf of the Emperor of Morocco. Article 7 of the treaty gave the Jews the right of settlement on the rock. The words of the pertinent part of the treaty reads, and that the subjects of the Emperor of Fez and Morocco, whether Moors or Jews, residing in the dominions of the King of Great Britain, shall entirely enjoy the same privileges that are granted to the English residing in Barbary. Article 13 of that treaty, of the Treaty of 1721, provided tacit naturalization to the Moroccan Jews of Gibraltar, and I quote, and as it has pleased Almighty God that by His Majesty's arms the island of Minorca and the city of Gibraltar are now part of His Majesty's dominions, it is therefore agreed that every person sailing in ships or living or residing there shall be esteemed as his natural born subjects upon producing proper passes from the governors or commanders and chiefs of those places. In 1721, the command of Gibraltar devolved on Colonel Hargreaves, who took great interest in the formation of a large and active trading community. He gave every encouragement to Jews to settle in Gibraltar, and he gave the first property grants in 1721 to a number of Jews. In 1723, a number of grants were made to Isaac Neto, one of which comprised of a piece of ground on which he had built a large room which the Jews have made a synagogue of. The structure built on the ground became known as a Shara Shamayim Synagogue. It later became known as La Esnoga Grande, or the Great Synagogue, due mainly to the volume of the congregants. In 1725, the community numbered 137, comprising of 12% of the total population. In that year, Colonel King, who replaced Hargraves, reminded the British government that the Jews were in Gibraltar in contravention of Utrecht, and he sought the expulsion of the Jews from Gibraltar. Real politic, born from the garrison's needs, made him stall and rethink. With the subsequent closure of the border for 40 years, the Jews were not bothered, for they ensured a commercial lifeline between Gibraltar and Morocco. By the census of 1753, Jews numbered 572, comprising 32% of the civilian population. Jews were not only traders, they were butchers, masons, tailors, porters, and they occupied such positions as were available. The first Jewish burial ground was in Red Sands beside the Protestant cemetery. The governor decided to move the cemeteries to the neutral ground for reasons of hygiene 
as the cemeteries were situated on top of the main water supplies. But the Jews refused to perform burial rites on the neutral ground, lest it became Spanish. They were given a site on the upper rock, and the cemetery at Jews', at Jews Gate serviced the community until 1848, when the North Front Cemetery came into use, after the neutral ground was annexed as British territory. In 1776, the civilian population of Gibraltar consisted of 3,000, 1,000 of which were Jews. In Ayala's Historia de Gibraltar, 1722, which is quoted by Mr. Serfati in his book, Ayala expresses his admiration at the lack of violence and criminality in a place with so many diverse religions, customs, and inhabitants as Gibraltar had. And this has been replicated throughout the centuries. In 1779, precautions were taken because it was suspected that Spain was poised to launch a war. About 300 Jews and Genoese were employed as part of the war preparations. Many Jews did military service and behaved so admirably that they were, re they were rewarded substantially by General Elliot. On the 5th of September, 1779, the Jews went up to their burial grounds at Jews' Gate, and there they had prayers for deliverance from the Spaniards. On the 17th of May, 1781, a, Spanish, a synagogue was shelled by the Spaniards and was burned down. On the night of the 23rd of May, a shell killed a number of Jews. With a supply ship sailing back to England, many of the inhabitants from Gibraltar decided to leave the garrison. The Great Siege ended in 1783, and Gibraltarian refugees started to return from Britain and Morocco. The town was found in, to be in a hideous state. It was in complete ruins. In his wonderful book, Gibraltar and the Moor, Spaniard and Britain, Colonel Kenyon says that the stipulations as to Jews in the Treaty of Utrecht cannot have been long observed, for we found the Jews were mentioned during the siege. He quotes the following from an officer at the time. The Jews were not a little serviceable that wrought in the most indefatigable manner and spared no pain where they could to be of any advantage either in the siege or after it. At the time, the leading Gibraltarian Jews were the Cardoso brothers who had come from Portugal and Isaac and Phineas Neto. The bulk of the Jewish residents came from Morocco. In 1791, the governor appointed Aaron Cardoso to be civilian advisor on police matters and also to act as representative of the Hebrew inhabitants. In later years, Cardoso met Admiral Nelson, who was on the way to the Battle of Trafalgar. Nelson told Cardoso, if I survive Cardoso, you shall no longer remain in, the dark, in this dark corner of the world. Gibraltar must have been very dark. <laughs> but Nelson died at Trafalgar and he never returned alive. Yet Cardoso continued to be involved with community affairs and interceded on behalf of the Jews and others. In 1814, Aaron Cardoso resigned from the position of representative of the Hebrew inhabitants and devoted himself to the construction of a sumptuous new house in Gibraltar's main square, in which he gave the most lavish entertainments. This building, our city hall, is used nowadays as the mayor's parlor. In 1817, Cardoso became involved in the public protest against the ordering council of that year, which altered unfavorably the terms of long leases of the crown. None Protestants were only to be allowed to own property after they had resided in Gibraltar for at least 15 years instead of the original five stipulated in 1804. This and other measures were a blow to property owners. In a letter to the Secretary of State, Lord Pelham, dated the 21st of June, 1803, Lieutenant Governor Thomas Trigg writes, I will now take the liberty to say that the Jews, from having been long established here and have no other country, are more interested in keeping possession of this place and have more fear from our losing it than any other persons. 
They are the most wealthy people and consequently the most ready and able to make purchases. I think them very useful and good subjects. The Roman Catholics are interested in the fate of this place and are attached to it in a considerable degree, though not so much as the Jews. With the acquisition of properties by Jewish landowners, names were given to streets in which their houses stood, such as Benzimra's Alley, Abekas' Passage, Benolia's Passage, Serfati's Passage, and Saroya's Ramp. In March 1819, a new amending order in council was passed, repealing all the elements of religious discrimination contained in the original order. Lands could be sold by and to Jews and Catholics, and no approval by the governor was necessary. In 1849, the new governor, Gardner, who had an instinct for generating controversies, raised the shadow of Utrecht. And he added that if he had his way, he would expel all the Jews from Gibraltar. Gardiner left. The Jews remained. In 1858, the disabilities of the Jews and the Roman Catholics were abolished and they were allowed to swear in a manner that did not clash with their own religious beliefs. However, Jews were not allowed to serve as jurors. Following communal furore, Mr. Moses Serfati commenced a campaign for the admission of jurors of the Jewish faith. On the 2nd September 1878, the first name in the history, the first time in the history of Gibraltar, the name of Abraham E. Levy appeared on the list of jurors. The Gibraltar Jewish community was by now comfortably entrenched in British Gibraltar in its full splendor. It had gathered a richly stable harvest of communal institutions and deeply nourished roots. There had also been established a solid fluorescence of relations with other faith communities. But anti-Semitic incidents, particularly adopted by Spanish settlers in Gibraltar, was worrisome. A.B. Serfati recalls that on Easter Saturdays, an effigy representing a Jew used to be taken in possession and burnt in Castle Street. At times, it was thrown a light into the patio of the great synagogue. In 1917, a young girl was almost burned alive by one of these burning effigies. Sadly, my own parents recall this wretched practice during their own childhood. In 1864, the managing board of the Jewish community was instituted at a general meeting. Yom Tov Bergel became the first president, president of the Junta Gubernativa de la Comunidad de Gibraltar. Interestingly, it was given a Spanish name. In 1895, the government provided a piece of ground in Bombhouse Lane where the Hebrew school still stands, flowing with memories etched in its corridors of, and classrooms by generations of Gibraltarians of many denominations. The contribution of the Jewish community to Gibraltar's development has been vibrant. In more recent years, Sir Joshua Hassan was prominent as the father of the post-Second World War Gibraltarian identity. But numerous Jews have thrown themselves into the political and civic pit to do battle for Gibraltar. The names of Samuel Benedict, Isaac uh, Abekasis, Abraham Serpati, Ms. Solomon Saruya, Mr. Solomon Levy, immediately come to mind. So what of Utrecht? Article 53 of the 1969 Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties states that a treaty which conflicts with an overriding norm of general international law, Jews cogens, is void if, at the time of its conclusion, it conflicts with that norm. Of course, Utrecht predates the Vienna Convention. Utrecht manifests in its phraseology, its terminology, and its style how immersed it was in the frame of mind prevalent in 1713. Utrecht breaches a peremptory norm of general international law from which no derogation is possible. It is racist. Whereas Utrecht refers to the Jews, the classification of which is national religious, oddly, Utrecht does not refer to Muslims. Although Moors were Muslims, they were identified by reference to a geographic area. Moor in English usage is a Muslim 
of Berber origins who had settled in North Africa. The word comes from the Latin Maori, first used by the Romans to denote inhabitants of the Roman province of Mauritania, comprising the eastern portion of modern Algeria and the northeastern portion of modern Morocco. Philip Hitti, author of the History of the Arabs, contends that the term Moor has geographic designation. He wrote, the Romans called Western Africa Mauritania, whence the Spanish Moro and the English Moor. The Berbers, therefore, were the Moors proper. But the term was conventionally applied to the Muslims of Spain and Northwestern Africa from the Berber origin. That being so, arguably, a Muslim who is not of Moorish stock would, be prohibit would not be prohibited from residing in Gibraltar. Whereas, under Utrecht, a Jew, regardless of his geographic background, is prohibited to resign in Gibraltar. If that is not racist, I don't know what it is. When we consider the terms of Utrecht, especially its anti-Semitic aspects, we invariably point a finger at Spain. But we must not forget that it takes two to tango. Utrecht implicates Britain as much as it implicates Spain. Simply put, the English crown consented in 1713 to the inclusion of an anti-Semitic clause. I have spoken of the Spanish Inquisition and the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492. I would be remiss if I omitted to mention the mass suicide of Jews in York in 1190 and the expulsion of all Britain's Jews by Edward I 700 years ago. Britain preceded France, Spain and Germany in its anti-Semitic wrath. Jews vanished from British shores for nearly 400 years until their readmission under Oliver Cromwell in 1656. Nevertheless, throughout these four centuries, anti-Jewish stereotypes became ingrained in the English life through sermons, plays, and literature. Christopher Marlowe's The Jew of Malta and Shakespeare's Shylock in The Merchant of Venice illustrate the strength of the negative stereotypes which permeated English society and provided the environment for the inclusion of the anti-Semitic provisions in Utrecht. The phrase Gibraltar Español, Gibraltar is Spanish, echoes across the Spanish state, sounding much like inebriated, drunken parrots. Spanish politicians and others repeat the same phrase with boring frequency. The Spanish ambassadors at the United Nations are fond of quoting the provisions of Utrecht. They squeeze the lemon of diplomatic semantics ad nauseum. Every aspect of Article 10 is repeated with indecent and slanted frequency. Yet, the anti-Semitic provisions of Utrecht are comfortably and purposely omitted by Spanish representatives. Mr. Margallo and others are famous for indulging in cherry-picking frolics on Utrecht, selecting the terms that better serve the Spanish government's sordid farce. The Spanish case rests on their interpretation of Utrecht as to self-determination, the territorial waters, right of first refusal, and an elasticized myriad of aspects which Spain claims restrains Gibraltar short of breathing. The anti-Semitic clause is as clear as the views across the Bay of Gibraltar on a clear day. Utrecht states, without mincing its words, that Jews cannot reside and have their dwellings in the said town of Gibraltar. For the Spanish government, of course, to invoke this aspect of Utrecht at the United Nations or in international fora would isolate it as odiously racist, fascist, and as anti-Semitic. So therefore, they do not refer to this aspect of Utrecht. For many up north, Gibraltar's mere existence is an offence that can only be remedied by sustained political and economic warfare. We, the people of Gibraltar, are not a rapacious colonial adventure, but men, women and children born in this place who are welcoming, we are respectful, and we are able to embrace 
racial, cultural and religious diversity. But we have shown that we are able nonetheless to stand up to coercion and illicit belligerency. We would not be found timid in guarding our national patrimony. On the 30th of April 1959, the then Spanish head of state, the fascist dictator Franco, gave a statement of the, um, to the editor of the Madrid Daily Pueblo, referring to the population of Gibraltar, the dictator Franco said, the Llanitos, the Gibraltarians, are entirely almost Spanish, although they take advantage of their British citizenship and the rest, the Jews, can live under one flag or another. I beg to differ. British Gibraltarian Jews will not happily live under one flag or another. With the issues provoked by Spanish fishermen in British Gibraltar territorial waters, fishy analogies are perhaps opportune. There are those in Spain, particularly of Mr. Margallo's fascist ilk, who have crawled in a tin, boxing in their prejudices and political rage. They have locked themselves inside, leaving the key outside, just like a tin of sardines. Utrecht is old news, it is antiquated, it is anachronistic. Did you hear about the man who went into an antique, antique shop and asked, what is new? This is what Utrecht is, old stuff. In a democracy, it is your vote that counts. In feudalism, it is your count that votes. <laughs> we, the people of Gibraltar, have the inalienable right to determine our future. It is time for our neighbours to the north to stop emulating the pharaohs. They were the kings of the Nile. Our Spanish neighbours are the kings of denial. <laughs> when news regarding Gibraltar hits the fan in Spain, one is reminded of the deaf man who heard a mute saying that the blind man had seen the lame man running. Why should the Spanish government be difficult when, with a little effort, they can be impossible? From Gibraltar, we have always extended a hand of friendship, but equally prepared to stand for our rights. The other side, not we, are on a rampage to nowhere. The late Joseph Brooke, for many years a senior member of Israeli governments, once said that people who negate coexistence harm existence. So what of Utrecht? Although liberation from Utrecht will be, would be cathartic for both sides of the frontier, Spain's gladiatorial denigration of our identity is abrasively belligerent for a country that purports to be a democracy. We, the people of Gibraltar, are the facts on the ground. Utrecht cannot alter my status, for it is supremely irrelevant to my status. I am one more unmovable fact on the ground. I am a Gibraltarian Jew who simply will not budge. Thank you and shalom. Yeah.